Our so-called leaders in Washington, whom we elected to safeguard our nation and our Constitution, are the betrayers, and that behind them are a comparatively small group of men whose sole objective is to enslave the whole world of humanity in their satanic plot of one world government. This satanic plot was launched back in the 1760s when it first came into existence under the name of the Illuminati. This Illuminati was organized by one Adam Weishaupt, born a Jew, who was converted to Catholicism and became a Catholic priest. And then, at the behest of the then newly organized House of Rothschild, defected and organized the Illuminati. Naturally, the Rothschilds financed that operation. And every war since then, beginning with the French Revolution, has been promoted by the Illuminati operating under various names and guises. I say under various names and guises because after the Illuminati was exposed and became too notorious, Weishaupt and his co-conspirators began to operate under various other names. In the United States, immediately after World War I, they set up what they called the Council on Foreign Relations, commonly referred to as the CFR. And this CFR is actually the Illuminati in the United States. And its hierarchy, the masterminds in control of the CFR, to a very great extent are the descendants of the original Illuminati conspirators. But to conceal that fact, most of them changed their original family names to American-sounding names. For example, the true name of the Dillons, Clarence and Douglas Dillon, once Secretary of the U.S. Treasury Department, is Lepowski. This is Frankfurt, Germany. Fifty years after the Bank of England opened its doors, a goldsmith named Amschel Moses Bauer opened a coin shop, a counting house, in 1743 and over the door he placed a sign depicting a Roman eagle on a red shield. The shop became known as the Red Shield Firm or in German Rothschild. When his son Amschel Meyer Bauer inherited the business he decided to change his name to Rothschild. Amschel soon learned that loaning money to governments and kings was more profitable than loaning to private individuals. Not only were the loans bigger, but they were secured by the nation's taxes. Mayor Rothschild had five sons. He trained them all in the skills of money creation, then sent them out to the major capitals of Europe to open branch offices of the family banking business. His first son, Amschel Mayer, stayed in Frankfurt to mine the hometown bank. His second son, Solomon, was sent to Vienna. His third son, Nathan, was clearly the most clever. He was sent to London at age 21 in 1798, a hundred years after the founding of the Bank of England. His fourth son, Carl, went to Naples, and his fifth son, Jacob, went to Paris. In 1785, Mayor Amschel moved his entire family to this larger house, a five-story dwelling he shared with the Schiff family. This house was known as the Green Shield. The Rothschilds and the Schiffs would play a central role in the rest of European financial history and in that of the United States. The Rothschilds broke into dealings with European royalty here at Williams Hall the palace of the wealthiest man in Germany, in fact, the wealthiest monarch in all Europe, Prince William of Hesse-Cassel. At first, the Rothschilds were only helping William speculate in precious coins. But when Napoleon chased Prince William into exile, he sent 550,000 pounds, a gigantic sum at that time, to Nathan Rothschild in London with instructions for him to buy consoles, British government bonds, also called government stock. But Rothschild used the money for his own purposes. With Napoleon on the loose, the opportunities of wartime investments were nearly limitless. 
William returned here sometime prior to the Battle of Waterloo in 1815. He summoned Rothschild and demanded his money back. The Rothschilds returned William's money with the interest the British consuls would have paid him had the investment actually been made. But the Rothschilds kept all the past profits they had made using William's money. Nathan Rothschild later bragged that in the 17 years he'd been in England, he'd increased his original 20,000 pound stake given to him by his father by 2,500 times. By cooperating within the family, the Rothschilds soon grew unbelievably wealthy. By the mid-1800s, they dominated all European banking and were certainly the wealthiest family in the world. They financed Cecil Rhodes, making it possible for him to establish a monopoly over the diamond and gold fields of South Africa. In America, they financed the Harrimans and Railroads, the Vanderbilts and Railroads and the Press, and Carnegie in the steel industry, among many others. In fact, during World War I, J.P. Morgan was thought to be the richest man in America. But after his death, it was discovered that he was actually only a lieutenant of the Rothschilds. Once Morgan's will was made public, it was discovered that he owned only 19% of J.P. Morgan companies. By 1850, James Rothschild, the heir of the French branch of the family, was said to be worth 600 million French francs, 150 million more than all the other bankers in France put together. He built this mansion called Ferrier, just east of Paris. Wilhelm I, on seeing it, exclaimed, kings couldn't afford this, it could only belong to a Rothschild. Another 19th century French commentator put it this way, there is but one power in Europe, and that is Rothschild. There is no evidence that their predominant standing in European or world finance has changed. There is a similar establishment of the Illuminati in England, operating under the name of the British Institute of International Affairs. There are similar secret Illuminati organizations in France, Germany, and other nations operating under different names. And all these organizations, including the CFR, continuously set up numerous subsidiary or front organizations that are infiltrated into every phase of the various nations' affairs. But at all times, the operations of these organizations were and are masterminded and controlled by the internationalist bankers who in turn were and are controlled by the Rothschilds. As revealed in News Bulletin number 122, one branch of the Rothschild family had financed Napoleon. Another branch of the Rothschilds, both branches, the real masterminds of the Illuminati, financed Britain, Germany, and the other nations in the Napoleonic Wars. Immediately after the Napoleonic Wars, the Illuminati assumed that all the nations were so destitute and so weary of wars that they'd be glad for any solution. So the Rothschild Stooges set up what they called the Congress in Vienna, and at that meeting they tried to create the first League of Nations, their first attempted one world government, on the theory that all the crowned heads of the European governments were so deeply in debt to them that they would, willingly or unwillingly, serve as their stooges. But the Tsar of Russia caught the stench of the plot and completely torpedoed it. The enraged Nathan Rothschild, then the head of that dynasty, vowed that someday he or his descendants would destroy the Tsar and his entire family. And his descendants did accomplish that very threat in 1917. The Illuminati operates on the very long-range basis. Whether it will take scores of years or even centuries, they have dedicated their descendants to keep the plot boiling until they hope the conspiracy is achieved. Number one, 
use monetary and sex bribery to obtain control of men already in high places in the various levels of all governments and other fields of endeavor. Once influential persons had fallen for the lies, deceits, and temptations of the Illuminati, they were to be held in bondage by application of political and other forms of blackmail, threats of financial ruin, public exposure and physical harm, even death, to themselves and loved members of their families. Do you realize how many present top officials in our federal government in Washington are controlled in just that way by the CFR? Do you realize how many homosexuals in our State Department, the Pentagon, all federal agencies, even in the White House, are controlled that way? Number two, Illuminati and the faculties of colleges and universities were to cultivate students possessing exceptional mental ability belonging to well-bred families with international leanings and recommend them for special training in internationalism. Such training was to be provided by granting scholarships to those selected by the Illuminists. That gives you an idea what a Rhodes Scholarship means. It means indoctrination into accepting the idea that only a one-world government can put an end to recurring wars and strife. That's how the United Nations was sold to the American people. All such scholars were to be first persuaded and then convinced that men of special talent and brains have the right to rule those less gifted on the ground that the masses don't know what is best for them physically, mentally, and spiritually. In addition to the Rhodes and similar scholarships, today there are three special Illuminati schools located in Gordonstown in Scotland, Salem in Germany, and Anavrita in Greece. These three are known ones, but there are others that are kept undercover. Prince Philip, the husband of Britain's Queen Elizabeth, was educated at Gordonstown at the instigation of Lord Louis Mountbatten, his uncle, a Rothschild relative who became Britain's admiral of the fleet after World War II ended. Number three. All influential people trapped into coming under the control of the Illuminati, plus the students who had been specially educated and trained, were to be used as agents and placed behind the scenes of all governments as experts and specialists, so they would advise the top executives to adopt policies which would, in the long run, serve the secret plans of the Illuminati One World Conspiracy and bring about the destruction of the governments and religions they were elected or appointed to serve. Number four, perhaps the most vital directive in Weishaupt's plan was to obtain absolute control of the press, at that time the only mass communications media, to distribute information to the public so that all news and information could be slanted so that the masses could be convinced that a one-world government is the only solution to our many and varied problems. Now do you know who owns and controls our mass communications media? I'll tell you, practically all the movie lots in Hollywood is owned by the Laymans, Kuhn Loeb and Company, Goldman Sachs, and other internationalist bankers. All the national radio and TV channels in the nation are owned and controlled by those same internationalist bankers. The same is true of every chain of metropolitan newspapers and magazines, also of the press wire services, such as Associated Press, United Press International, etc. The supposed heads of all those media are merely the fronts for the internationalist bankers who, in turn, compose the hierarchy of the CFR, today's Illuminati in America. Now can you understand why the Pentagon's press agent, Sylvester, so brazenly proclaimed that the government has the right to lie to the people? What he really meant was, 
that our CFR-controlled government had the power to lie to and be believed by the brainwashed American people.